Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to CFD Board's public forum on the Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct. My name is Leo Rajeski. I'm CFD Board's General Counsel and the Managing Director of Professional Standards. Also in connection with our topic today, I was the staff liaison to CFD Board's Commission on Standards, and I am the staff liaison now on CFD Board's Standards Resource Commission. I have the honor of being here today with Blaine Aiken, CFP, who is the chair of the Standards Resource Commission. Um, Blaine has a very long and important history at CFP Board. He is the former chair of CFP Board's Board of Directors, um, and he's been a CFP professional for 33 years. Congratulations on that, Blaine. Thank you, Leah. And Blaine also serves as executive chairman of FI360 and CFEX. So, Blaine, we're really happy that you're here with us today. It's great to be with you. Before we begin our discussion on CFP Board's Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, the housekeeping matters uh, for our webinar. So, a couple points. If you need to refresh your console, press F5, or if you're using a Mac, Command R. We do have a web uh, a webinar interface that you can use to submit questions. Um, you should know that there is no CE being offered for attendance today. The slide deck will be made available online and the webinar will be recorded and that presentation will be available after the webinar is concluded at CFP.net. Um, so CFP board uh, began a public awareness campaign designed to support and enhance the recognition and value of the CFP marks. I wanted to talk about that briefly today before we begin the webinar on the Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct because there's been significant developments in this regard that I wanted to share with you. Since we first launched the campaign back in April of 2011, the public awareness campaign has been a great success. In 2017, our brand tracking study found that unaided awareness of the CFP certification amongst our target audience was 10 percentage points above where we were before we initiated the public awareness campaign. It was showing a downward trend though, and that signaled to us that it was time to refresh the campaign. CFP board took a data-driven approach to the process of updating the campaign. We hired heart and mind strategies to conduct brand research to find out what resonates with the target audience then we hired a new ad agency that developed creative concept based upon the research. Our approach is to persuade with facts and motivate with, with emotion. It involved the development of a new brand promise. This isn't something that consumers would see or hear, but it's a statement that guides how and what consumers hear. The new brand promise is more emotional, focusing on the benefits and consumer facing. Partnering with a certified financial planner professional provides confidence today and more secure and a more secure tomorrow. So we call the top performing campaign, It's All Possible with the CFP Professional. The campaign is motivating consumers to partner with the CFP Professional for holistic thinking that incorporates all aspects of finance, personalized comprehensive and flexible plans, and plans that are created in their best interest. So the campaign brings these benefits to life by highlighting personal stories. The ads tell the stories of different people at different points in their financial lives. They emphasize the value of having a personal financial plan, and they show a personal relationship with a CFP professional who is a partner in the process. Through the campaign, the CFP certification brand is highlighted to increase recall and awareness. I wanted to share with you briefly two 30-second TV spots that we have issued in connection with the campaign. Making my dreams a reality takes more than just investment advice. From insurance to savings to retirement, it takes someone with experience and knowledge who can help me build a complete plan. Brian, my certified financial planner professional, is committed to working in my best interest. I call it my comfortable future plan. And it's all possible with a CFP professional.
We've saved our money, and now we get to spend it our way. But we worry if we have enough to last. Ellen, our certified financial planner professional, helps us manage our cash flow and plan for the unexpected. Her experience and training gave us the courage to go for it. It's our confident forever plan. And it's all possible with a CFP professional. Find your... The campaign's paid advertising is placed across a wide variety of networks and programming, and the television continues to drive awareness like no other medium, of course. It's the backbone of the media buy, but the TV buy will be flanked and is being flanked with radio, magazine, digital, and, and social uh, ads all running concurrently. So let's turn now uh, to the purpose of today's webinar, which is to discuss the Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct. To understand and appreciate the Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct, you have to understand the role that CFE Board plays in the profession. The CFE Board's mission is to benefit the public by granting the CFE certification and upholding it as a recognized standard of excellence for competent and ethical personal financial planning. So CFE Board is a professional organization. There are many types of financial advisor oversight that exist in the profession beyond CFE Board. As you're well aware, uh, the federal law is the law of the land, and at the base of the regulations that apply to a CFP professional are the regulations of the federal government, like the SEC, the DOL, and self-regulatory organizations like FINRA. If you view this in the shape of a pyramid, then resting on top of the federal regulations and sometimes separate from them are the state regulators. It could be uh, a state insurance regulator or it could be a state securities regulator if you're not regulated on the federal level. On top of both the federal and state regulations, we have the policies and procedures of the firm. If you work at a firm and a firm has policies and procedures, that's another area of oversight that exists over a CFP professional. And that's where CFP Board comes in as a professional organization. Professional organizations often have standards that are higher than what the law requires. Professional organizations build upon the minimum requirements that the law sets and offer standards for a professional to abide by. And of course, the cap of the pyramid, the very top, are the individual's own standards that they may set for themselves that could be higher than uh, the standards of the regulators, their firm, or a professional organization. So CFP Board periodically updates its code and standards to keep current with changes in the field of financial planning, to advance the profession, to maintain the value, integrity, and relevance of the CFP certification, and to address new products, services, and technologies that affect the profession. CFP Board last updated its standards in 2007, and the updates that recently went into uh, the, the, that CFP Board recently issued become effective on October 1st, 2019. The revisions that came into place are consistent with and central to the purpose and mission of CFP Board. So it was in March of 2018 that CFP Board announced that its board of directors had unanimously approved the new Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct. And recently, CFP Board announced some technical revisions to the Code and Standards. So first and foremost, one of the major changes to the Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct is that they are set forth in one document. The content previously had been set forth in four documents, including the Code of Ethics, Rules of Conduct, financial planning practice standards, and terminology. CFP Board went on the road beginning back in 2016 and held public forums around the country and listened to hundreds, if not thousands, of CFP professionals. And along the way, in those public forums uh, and in other avenues, we asked CFP professionals uh, whether it'd be helpful to have one document at CFP Board that sets forth the code and standards and the overwhelming response was that would be helpful, and it resulted in this change. Once CFP Board issued the Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct, 
it formed a standards resource commission to develop proposed guidance resources to educate and inform CFP professionals about the code of ethics and standards of conduct. CFP board is an organization that is led by the profession at all levels. And the Standards Resource Commission is no different. Like our board of directors, like our disciplinary and ethics commission, our public policy council, our council on education and council on exams, and the other various bodies that work with and through CFP board, it's composed of members of different channels of the profession. At CFP board, we have CFP professionals working in a variety of different aspects and areas of the profession and different business models, different compensation models. And as CFP board undertakes its work, it routinely strives to make sure that the members of the volunteer bodies who are serving these functions come from those different business model backgrounds so that CFP board can keep those in mind as it's moving forward with the work that it conducts. So here at the Standards Resource Commission level, um, it includes CFP professionals representing those various business and compensation models, CFP professionals, as you might expect, providing financial planning services. And also, um, we had to bring in the lawyers, uh, individuals with experience interpreting statutes, rules, and regulations related to the provision of investment advice or the sale of insurance, securities, or other products. And because CFP Board is a 501c3 organization, uh, we always have amongst these bodies some individuals who are public members who are there to represent the public and make sure that the consumer's perspective is being shared. So let me show you who is serving on the Standards Resource Commission. We have John Petit, a CFP professional from Schwab, Ryan Waldo from Merrill Lynch, Kevin Ruth from Fidelity, and Peter Richardson from Northwestern Mutual, and Pat Daxon, who come, who is at Raymond James, five individuals who work at firms that are larger in size and, again, hail from different business model backgrounds. We have several individuals who work at smaller firms. Uh, Bill Pruitt, who is a longstanding uh, volunteer at NAPFA. Linda Lights, a CFP professional who's been joining uh, us um, during our most recent round of public forums to talk to CFP professionals about our standards. And Randy Gardner, who has a lot of experience working with the Financial Planning Association, and other CFP professional who also has a background as a JD. I mentioned that we do have some lawyers on the Standards Resource Commission. Uh, Melanie Fine is somebody who has a background on fiduciary law as well as banking. And Jean Maloney, who's at Federated Investors, is somebody who has decades of experience analyzing fiduciary issues. I already mentioned Blaine Aiken, who works at uh, FI360, a certifying body. And two other individuals that appear before you, uh, Pam Banks, who works with Consumer Reports, and Lori Trewinski, who is at AARP, are the public members who are serving on the Standards Resource Commission. Together, these individuals have been working to develop guidance resources for CFP professionals. Uh, they are hard at work uh, here, listening to the feedback we're receiving from you in the public forums and in meetings like today so that they can prioritize the guidance that will come out with respect to the code and standards so that it's meaningful for you. You should know that the feedback we receive from you today will be shared with the Standards Resource Commission so that they can take it into account in developing the guidance resources. So Blaine, why don't I turn it over to you now and perhaps you can uh, talk to everybody about some of the key changes in the code and standards. All right, thank you very much, Leo. This is a great opportunity to get uh, feedback from all of you who are listening today and uh, very much like at the live public forum. So we're going to provide some information about the key changes that have been made in the standards. And then we're going to go uh, interactive with you to try and uh, solicit information from you about the topics that you feel uh, should be a focus uh, of the commission as we develop the guidance overall. And Leo, as you talked about in the uh, in your descriptions of the uh, the way the commission is set up, we always start with the idea of the, the mission of the organization, of CFP Board as a whole. So as you mentioned, the CFP Board's mission is to benefit the public, and it really does reflect the commitment that all CFP professionals make to high standards of competency and ethics. Well, in this round of uh, changes to the code and standards, we really have as a cornerstone the expanded fiduciary obligation. And here specifically, 
the obligation is to act as a fiduciary and therefore act in the best interest of the client at all times when providing financial advice. And this is an expansion of where, we'll, uh, where we have been prior to this update of the standards. So we'll talk a little bit now about what it means to act as a fiduciary, and we'll focus in on three key areas here, the duty of loyalty, the duty of care, and the duty to follow client inst instructions. So here's what we say, the fiduciary's obligation is to act in the client's best interest. The duty of loyalty is closely tied to that, to place the client's interest ahead of the interest of the CFP professional, and it has a great deal to do with conflicts of interest, specifically to either avoid conflicts or fully disclose, obtain consent, and properly manage those conflicts, always in the best interest of the client. So this has to be done without regard to the interests of others, uh, such as the firm or uh, the related parties that might be involved, and certainly ahead of the interests of the CFP professional. So we move from these ethical responsibilities under the duty of loyalty to the more competency uh, side of the duty of care. Here the obligation is to act with the care, skill, prudence, and diligence of a professional. And in doing so, you need to have consideration given to the client's goals, their risk tolerance, their objectives, and special circumstances. But then oftentimes we don't uh, think so much about this other duty, which is very, very important from a practical perspective, and that is the duty to follow client's instructions. So we have the obligation to comply with the terms of the engagement or other governing documents, and we are obligated to follow the client's reasonable and lawful directions. So this is a, in recognition of the fact that we may have advice that we're rendering, and yet the client may choose to go in a different direction. And as long as those are reasonable and lawful directions, we need to follow that. So when I talked about this being an expansion of where we were under the previous standards, or I should say where we are now, because these standards don't actually take in effect until October of 2019. But here the application is at all times when providing financial advice to a client. Now that's significantly more expansive, expansive than when providing financial planning or material elements thereof. We're talking about client engagements in particular here. So who is a client? It's any person, including a natural person, a business organization, or a legal entity, to whom the CFP professional provides or agrees to provide professional services, and it would be pursuant to an engagement. So here we rule out things like the, the cocktail conversation where somebody might casually bring up uh, financial planning knowing that you're in the field. It does need to be a client relationship. But I think, Leo, it's probably important here to mention about pro bono. Pro bono does come into play here. Essentially, you have a, an engagement with the individual, and it's essentially compensation waived. So compensation is really not the driver here, is it? That's right, Blaine. So there's no requirement that compensation be provided for um, the standard to be in effect. So what we want to do at this point is to engage you who are listening in today in a vignette that we have assembled here as an illustration of the type of guidance that we expect to be providing. So what we ask of you is to read through this vignette and then think about which of these is the best answer for this scenario. And in a moment, we're going to move to a screen that will allow you to vote for one of these three answers. So in this situation, we have a CFP professional, Jack, and a new client, Jane, and there has been information collected from Jane about her risk tolerance. And she has stated that she can tolerate a 30% reduction in the value of her portfolio, but she's also stated that she has a conservative risk tolerance. So based on what Jane has provided, Jack's supervisor has made a suggestion uh, for a particular um, product in her portfolio this, in this case, it's a private placement that promises to be very successful but does have a high risk of loss. So Jack conducts an analysis and determines that the investment would match Jane's stated willingness to sustain a loss, and uh, Jane does ultimately decide to purchase the investment. So now think about which of these three options, A, B, or C, 
you believe would be the best in answer to that scenario. Please take a moment now to record your, your answer to this particular scenario. And when you have clicked on the choice that you have decided upon, please press submit. And Blaine, while um, everybody is filling out their choice between A, B, and C, we have a question that came in from uh, Eric who wants to know what the difference is between CFP Board and the Standards Resource Commission. Sure. So CFP Board formed the Standards Resource Commission for the purpose of developing and providing guidance. The Standards Resource Commission works with staff, including myself, to develop that and then make recommendations to CFP Board about what guidance should be issued and ultimately CFP Board then uh, issues the guidance to the public. And so that's the structure that we've put in place in many ways, this is uh, consistent with the approach we took with the Commission on Standards. That's the relationship between the two. Very good. Well, let's now take a look and see how uh, people responded here. So the overwhelming selection was that Jack violated his duty of care because a prudent CFP professional acting with diligence would have spoken with Jane about the inconsistent risk tolerance information prior to recommending the investment. And that is, in fact, the answer we had in mind. But, Leo, one of the things that's uh, come up in the public forums and uh, regularly comes up, it seems, is that uh, people will point out some other plausible answers at times that perhaps we didn't even think about, and it's made us uh, they take extra care in terms of how we formulate these answers. But in this case, C actually comes into play, right? That's right, Blaine. So if you look back at the fact pattern, it talked about um, – recommending a private placement. And so there's a question about whether Jane would be a qualified investor for this. And so the facts aren't all presented on the screen, but there is a question about whether the investment itself is appropriate for Jane. And really what that um, calls in mind is that as the Standards Resource Commission is developing these resources, it's very important to be very careful in thinking about all the different permutations that could happen with a particular fact pattern and to be you know, very careful in issuing this guidance. Right. And we're very eager to have your input. Uh, what we have found at the public forums is people like the idea of the vignettes uh, with the multiple choice questions. We've also received some strong guidance that it's not just identifying the correct answer, as we have done, and I should flip here to demonstrate. There it is. B is the correct answer. But it's not just to say B is correct it's to go on to explain why. And not only why is B the best answer, but tell a little bit more about why A or C would not necessarily be the best answer. And that's right, Blaine. And so today, we're not able to uh, have this public forum with all of you in the audience together to get that feedback and interaction. But as you're examining this case study, if you might type in on your computer in that chat box to let us know your feedback, is this type of example a useful way to provide guidance to you. In other words, the CFP board were to come out with examples like this, we call them vignettes, where there's a factual background, some options and choices, and then uh, follow on with that with uh, the answer and the explanation of the answer. Is that a useful format that you believe would be helpful for the commission on for the Standards Resource Commission to provide guidance to CFP professionals? And please do. Uh, put information in throughout the course of this um, presentation. We're very eager to collect your feedback on that. Now, here's another way that we're kind of trying to collect feedback. We have, uh, we have the approach of identifying those topics where we have heard the most interest expressed in having further guidance provided. And on this screen, we've identified four topics here that we've heard come up before and that we are already planning on developing guidance to address. And much of that is underway on these particular ones. But what we ask of you is to help give us some further guidance here. And so if you have thoughts about whether you uh, particularly like a particular uh, question here, uh, give us that kind of feedback. If you don't like one of these questions, don't think it's necessary, feel free to give us guidance on that or add to questions that we might have. And Blaine, we have received some feedback and I'd say overwhelmingly so far, um, we're hearing from many people 
that the example questions or real-life scenarios are helpful, practical application is helpful. Um, they like having uh, it presented in this format with another slide that would provide the information that provides the answer key. So uh, thank you very much for providing that feedback. At least 40 or so people um, have provided us this feedback today saying that this is a useful type of guidance resource. That's excellent. Thank you for chiming in on these. All right, so let's turn now to a closely related issue, and this is the duty to fully disclose material conflicts. And so there's multiple parts to this. There's the disclosure obligation to fully disclose all material conflicts of interest that could affect the professional relationship. And then in the standard itself, we talk about conflict of interest defined. And this is when the interests of a CFP professional and firm are adverse to the CFP professional's duties to the client. Or, and this second one is an interesting one, when the CFP professional has duties to one, uh, one client that are adverse to another client. And an area that we've heard quite a bit about is in the area of divorce. So you may have been providing services for a married couple and that couple uh, splits, and then you're confronted with a uh, conflict between the representation of those individuals. So we will be developing guidance on situations like that, and that's why that's what we mean essentially as an illustration of where one profession, one client's uh, as a particular interest may conflict with those of another client. Oftentimes we get a question about what exactly is material. And this is one where we, we have offered this, um, this sort of an assessment and it is consistent with what you'll often find in the uh, regulatory environment. And in our context, it is when a reasonable client or prospective client would consider the conflict of interest important in making a decision. And Leo, maybe this is a good point to talk about how does this actually play out if there's a, ever a question uh, about a particular CFP professional's adherence to the conduct standards. So maybe you could just give a, uh, a little bit about the deck and how uh, you would be facing essentially a jury of your peers is a loose way of saying that. Yeah, so Blaine, you bring up the back end of the standards. So these are the standards of conduct that govern a safety professional's behavior. We have, as I mentioned earlier, a group of CFP professionals, as well as a couple public members um, whose responsibility it is to evaluate you know, potential misconduct and determine what the appropriate outcome is. Again, this is a peer review body um, of individuals who mostly are CFP professionals who sit and analyze these matters. And you should know um, that we have a very detailed and comprehensive process in place to uh, do our very best to have a process that is fair to the CFP professional who's being evaluated and uh, but credible to the public as well. And we very recently issued um, some revisions to those procedural rules. We went out asking for public comments. Public comments are due in January. Um, let, I'm sorry, they're due uh, in late January. Right. And so if you have the opportunity to review our proposed procedure rules and provide your feedback, that's something we would greatly appreciate because our goal is to have a very robust and healthy process at CFP Board. I think that's an important uh, consideration as we think about whenever we have terms like this that are out there. And I know one of the other things you mentioned, Leo, is please speak up if you'd like to volunteer for, for the uh, for deck. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, close out the topic uh, here with respect to providing information about how we treat the conflicts and the obligation to fully disclose. And so this is an illustration of uh, how you might think of this as a progression from disclosing sufficiently specific facts so that a reasonable client could understand the conflict and how it could affect the advice. And here we have to recognize that any ambiguity is interpreted in favor of the client. Delivery form, uh, written disclosure is not required. Oral disclosure, however, will be weighed as CFP board deems appropriate. And so here there's a variety of reasons that we uh, have gone through in terms of making the determination that disclosure would not, written disclosure would not be uh, required. And a lot of that is practical in nature but as we stressed uh, throughout the, uh, the standards, 
documentation is really, really important. And so where there is ambiguity, having documented information is very helpful. Here again, we have got obtaining informed consent. And so we do not have a requirement for written consent. However, uh, when will we consider the, uh, the consent to be informed and inferred? Well, you, we look at things like, would there be great harm involved uh, if, if, if informed consent had not actually been provided or if there was ambigu ambiguity in that part? Or uh, is there a significant departure in, in the advice that's being provided from commonly accepted practices? Now, another element of this that is important is the obligation to manage uh, conflicts. And we're, we have a standard that requires uh, adopting and following business practices that are reasonably designed to prevent material conflicts, conflicts from compromising the CFP professional's ability to act in the client's best interest. So with that, we're going to come to another vignette and look for your input. Here we have a situation where Cindy, the CFP professional, has served James, the client, for a number of years. James has a very attractive car that's rare and expensive. He's looking to sell it. And uh, Cindy likes the car and would like to buy it. That makes James happy. But there is obviously a conflict here because there is an uh, advisory relationship that exists between the two. So the question is, what is Cindy's best option to manage this conflict of interest? Would it be A, B, C, or D? So we're going to flip now to your screen that allows you to input your best, uh, your best uh, representation of the uh, answer here that you believe is the correct one. And as you're filling out your answers A through D, um, keep in mind as we're working our way through these topics, one of our goals today is to obtain feedback from you on the kinds of guidance resources you believe would be helpful with respect to the code and standards. So throughout the presentation or even afterwards, but in particular today um, in your uh, webinar interaction box, if you could indicate to us what areas you believe would be useful for guidance. We are capturing the information. We'll take it back to the Standards Resource Commission. If there's issues you would like to see addressed, please share that with us so that we can take that into account as we're developing these guidance materials. All right, so let's take a look at what people thought here. So again, we have uh, an overwhelming choice, and that being that Cindy should inform James that she cannot purchase the car from him unless he obtains an independent appraisal uh, for the sale of the car. Now that is in fact what we had in mind here, and it does uh, illustrate that what we're talking about is the need for true objectivity involved. So you're not going to be able to achieve true objectivity without bringing an independent party in here uh, to make that evaluation. So again, thank you for your feedback on that uh, with respect to uh, both providing the answer, as well as your consideration as to how you like this kind of an approach. So I'm going to close out this section by talking a little bit about guidance on the conflicts. These, again, these are questions that are in our minds as being particularly important to address in guidance. We'd love your feedback here as to whether you agree with these three questions as being worthy of us providing uh, guidance relatively quickly and also your um, thoughts about any particular other areas that might be helpful to provide guidance on the subject of conflicts. So we're going to let you uh, go ahead and do that at your will. But at this time, Leo, let's turn it over to you and talk a little bit about financial planning. That's great, Blaine. And thank all of you for providing your feedback here. We see some of you would like for us to address rollovers, um, others are talking about other topics that you believe would be helpful for guidance for CFP board to provide. Um, thank you for sharing um, the information that you're providing to us that we can uh, take it into account. Let's talk about financial planning. CFP board, certified financial planner, board of standards. Financial planning is uh, critical to CFP board. Right? That's why we're here. Um, so when we think about financial planning, uh, one of the first things that our commission on standards did was to think about the definition we use for financial planning. 
and quite a bit of time was spent looking at this and ultimately CFP board adopted a new financial planning definition. It was intended to be shorter. It was intended to be accurate and concise. We liked the old one, but we thought it was a little bit long. And so ultimately, CFP board came up with a new definition. It's financial planning is a collaborative process that help maximize a client's potential for meeting life goals through financial advice that integrates relevant elements of the client's personal and financial circumstances. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about some of the guidance resources we already issued, but the first one that came out was CFP Board's commentary, which we issued back in March of 2018. The commentary, amongst other things, goes through in great detail why CFP Board developed the new definition and dissects the language to illustrate why we believe it's a useful definition for financial planning. There are, of course, other changes uh, to financial in the area of financial planning. So first and foremost, in, on top of the definition, we substantially updated and reorganized the financial planning process. Um, you may know that CFP Board had uh, stated uh, for many years that the financial planning process involved six steps. And one of the major steps, or one of the major changes, I should say, is for there now to be a seven-step financial planning process. Uh, we've put forth in that commentary document that I mentioned to you earlier a chart that walks through in great detail um, the differences between the current practice standards and the revised practice standards. It's a full-page chart that summarizes the changes. Um, very briefly, um, one, the first step, establishing and defining the relationship with the client, was moved to a different section, and there was some other reordering that occurred. Uh, but that is a, a significant change now with CP Board moving to a seven-step process. CP Board also has a new standard for determining when a CFP professional is required to comply with the financial planning practice standards. And there's also a standard, it's a new standard, for when a CFP professional is required uh, to comply with the practice standards, but the client does not want financial planning. Uh, any of you out there, have you ever had a client who you told that you believe they needed financial planning and they told you that they did not want it? If you've heard of that, you can let us know. As we've gone, uh, Around the country now, Blaine, we've already uh, done two tours for our forums. We were in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia, Boston, and New York back in, February, uh, back in September. And more recently, we were in Miami, Orlando, Charlotte, and Atlanta. Uh, thank you all who came out for those public forums. Uh, it was great to hear from all of you. And I think one thing that we heard along the road was confirmation that there are times when a client does not want financial planning and that the standards should address it, which in fact they do. And you know, Leo, the, we did have a question here about whether a written plan is required or not. So maybe you could comment on that while we're on this subject. Sure, Blaine. So the standards do not require a safety professional to provide a written financial plan. You know, what, this, what the standards focus on quite a bit is that financial planning is a process. In fact, the code and standards refer to a financial plan in only one place. That's the definition of financial advice. Otherwise, what CFE Board is focusing on is financial planning, which is very often an ongoing delivery of services to a client um, where you know, the, the, the collection of the advice being provided is being delivered as part of that financial planning relationship. So um, we talked a second ago about when do the practice standards apply. So uh, let's be clear about what it is we're addressing right now. The fiduciary duty that Blaine mentioned earlier applies at all time when providing financial advice. So this discussion is not about whether the fiduciary duty applies. It does. The question is, when must you follow the financial planning practice standards, the seven-step process that, are set, that is set forth in CP Board's code and standards? So there's really three ways that it applies. The first one should be fairly obvious to you. It's when the CFP professional agrees to provide or provides financial planning. When that happens, the financial planning practice standards apply. The second circumstance is when the CFP professional agrees to provide or provides financial advice, 
that requires the integration of relevant elements to act in the client's best interests. In other words, you're not using the words financial planning, uh, but you look to the definition. If the advice requires that integration, then you need to follow the practice standards. The third one is a bit different than what we had uh, what we have now under the existing standards. Under the existing standards, we look to the client's understanding and intent in engaging the CFP professional. The problem with that standard is it applies even if the client has an unreasonable understanding, um, the so-called crazy client. And uh, what the code and standards say is that the client's belief must be reasonable, but if the client does have a reasonable basis to believe um, that the CFP professional will provide or has provided financial planning, um, then the practice standards do apply without regard to anything else. So that in and of itself is enough for the obligation to comply with the practice standards to be triggered. So we come forth here with some uh, potential guidance areas on the financial planning practice standards. What is the difference between financial planning and financial advice? Examples of when a CFP professional is required to provide financial planning. Explain and provide examples of financial advice that requires financial planning. And then again, give us some examples. When must the CFP, you know, what does the CFP professional has to do when a client doesn't want financial planning, but the CFP professional uh, needs to provide it? So, um, if you could provide and comment here today whether you believe these are useful topics or if there are other topics you believe would be helpful, um, that would be very helpful for us to take into account as we're developing these guidance resources. I mentioned earlier the update to the steps in the process. Here we have a, a bit of an overview of those changes. I mentioned that this is presented in great detail and commentary. As you can see, establishing the funding relationship has been moved to Section A10 to provide information to a client. Um, and we begin with Step 1. Step 1 under the revised practice standards is understanding the client's personal and financial circumstances. In other words, from CFP Board's perspective, everything begins by understanding what's going on with the client. Until you have developed that understanding, you're not ready yet to begin identifying and selecting goals and then analyzing uh, courses of action. Um, so the seven steps are set forth here. Um, one area that got quite a bit of feedback along the way is about developing the financial planning recommendation and presenting the financial planning recommendations. Previously, this had been one step of the process, but as CFP Board's Commission on Standards evaluated it, the members of the commission, CFP professionals mostly, um, offer their perspective that those two steps can be very different. In fact, um, many uh, CFP professionals now are working as part of teams. And as working as part of teams, sometimes uh, the person who's developing the recommendation is not the person presenting it, which is a great illustration of why those become two separate steps in the um, Somebody, uh, Nancy, has a comment here that she believes it'd be really helpful for CFP Board um, to provide some guidance on how the standards apply to somebody working as part of a team at a firm. Um, if that's an area you believe would be helpful for guidance, maybe you could note that here in the comment field and let us know if you agree, and let us know if there are other areas that you believe would be useful. Yeah, I think it's a, a very good question and one that we've been spending some time on in terms of how does that apply, because it certainly does. We've, uh, we know that this situation comes up. And we actually had another question about uh, what are the uh, different considerations the board has about uh, in terms of how the standards relate to client-facing versus non-client-facing roles. And here, uh, the fact of the matter is that whether you're client-facing or not client-facing, the obligations that you have under the code and standards do not differ. Your activities may differ somewhat, but your obligations remain the same. Uh, but I think your illustration uh, in particular here, Leo, whenever we talk about teams and perhaps they are separating some of the functions, there would be responsibilities that uh, do come into play uh, for each and that all, all of the standards apply. 
That's correct, Blaine. I know that the Standards Resource Commission has that uh, top of mind to be thinking about what can we do to uh, share with CFP professionals uh, how that team concept plays out with respect to the code and standards. Uh, there's a question from uh, an individual asking about, you took out um, the first step. Where is it now? How does that work? Standard, section A10 is a standard that talks about providing information to a client, and it now deals with that uh, topic of um, establishing and defining that relationship. So that's where you would look to find that now. In other words, the practice standards now focus on the delivery of the service, the actual provision of the service, as opposed to the establishing of the relationship. So it's a slightly different focus. The, the substance is still within the code and standards, but the practice standards themselves have, a, have a, now a, a focus that's solely on the delivery of the service. So in terms of guidance on the practice standards, so um, some questions that we've been uh, addressing with CFP professionals as we've been working through our public forums are what are the significant changes to the practice standards? Can you give me types of information the CFP professional should document pursuant to the practice standards? The documentation requirement, by the way, is a very principles-based requirement that begins at the outset of the practice standard. It talks about um, a CFP professional and uh, when documentation should be provided. Um, it says um, that it requires a CFP professional to act prudently in documenting information as the facts and circumstances require, taking into account the policies and procedures of the CFP professional's firm and the obligation to act in the client's best interest. Again, this is an objective principle-based standard. The application de depends on the facts and circumstances. It was very intentional that the CFP board decided not to have specific standards for how a CFP professional must document the information because there may be different options that are available to CFP professional, and it was not CFP professional CFP board's goal to be too prescriptive in constraining the CFP professional in the ways they might uh, provide that uh, documentation. Ah, I see we have another question. Um, this gathering client data is no longer part of the process. Actually, gathering client data is, remains a very important part of the process. It begins earlier on. It begins in step one when you're understanding the client's uh, personal and financial circumstances. Um, this is the step in the process where you do gather that information. And Blaine, as you know, uh, there's another time much later in the process where this idea of gathering information comes into play. Do you want to talk about that? So uh, you have that obligation right at the outset, but then really all along the way there can be the uh, obligations to collect data as it relates to uh, the relationship as a whole. And that's right. And then, um, and then even beyond when you get through, you know, your initial work with the client, you know, many CFP professionals have clients who they're with for 20 or 30, 33 years in your practice. Right. Others have uh, careers that have extended like yours. And you have clients who may have been with you all along that way. And so when you think about the practice standards, you're really living in the monitoring and updating and implementing. Absolutely. It's a, it's a never-ending process, really. It's a cycle. And we've talked actually about the circular rep representation of the steps in the process where monitoring brings you back to that ongoing role. Let's talk a little bit now about disclosures. So disclosures uh, under our standards is providing information to the client. What do you need to do? Fundamentally, um, the obligation under the code and standards is very similar uh, to what exists under the, under the current standards. So the new and the, and the current are very similar. Um, it's a new standard about um, you know, providing clients with information at the time of the engagement and when it needs to be provided in writing. Um, and so you know, previously, CFP board dealt with this in two documents, Blaine. It was both in the rules of conduct and the practice standards. And we had a disclosure guide we, um, you know, made available to CFP professionals so that they were aware that this obligation had its components in two different areas under CFP board standards. Right. And we, one way we try to help address that is by having one document, right? Yes, absolutely. And there's um, another related aspect to this comes into uh, being conscientious about looking at the practical realities of disclosure. And we actually had a question come in about uh, use of the ADV and whether the ADV satisfies disclosure obligations. And it does, in fact, in part, uh, oftentimes. There is the, uh, a process that we go through in the guidance uh, development 
where we look at what are the regulatory requirements, what are common practices, and then identifying areas where the CFP board standard goes higher in uh, regard to the disclosure obligation. So you will be seeing guidance in these areas. ADV and other regulatory filings are critically important, and we, so we've gone out of our way to make sure that we're uh, aligning the disclosure obligations as best we can to uh, make the required regulatory fi filings work in many respects. So, Blaine, this is an area where um, we actually don't need a lot of feedback about whether we should provide these resources sure. because we know that people would like to see them. We've had the you know, disclosure great. guide before. We're working on uh, providing more materials on that front now. When you think about disclosure, though, there's, um, you know, in Section A10, lists what they are, one through eight, and then when it's financial planning, there's another requirement. And so it becomes much easier to see them. Fundamentally, um, you know, there's one that must always be in writing. That's effectively the firm's privacy policy, your right. privacy policy as a CFP professional, the one that you're providing your clients. And there's one that never has to be in writing. That's the disclosure of conflicts. Everything else, it depends upon whether the engagement is for financial advice or whether it's for financial planning. If it's financial advice, it can be orally or in writing, and if it's financial planning, it needs to be in writing. You know, Leo, there is uh, one area where I think it would be helpful to get uh, further guidance from those who are listening in terms of uh, the disclosure obligations that are now laid out in the code and standards uh, where you feel like there isn't something that you're doing there, that you don't have an obligation, that this may represent something new for you and you're perhaps troubled by how you would uh, make that disclosure. Love to hear if there are particular areas of interest of, uh, in that regard. Right, so if you have any feedback for us on that front, please share that with us today. Right. Um, so there are standards for timing, delivery, and updating. Um, so prior to at the time of the engagement is the standard for conflicts. It's before providing any financial advice to a client regarding which the CFE professional has that material conflict of interest. We talked about the delivery, whether writing or, or not, and updating whenever there's a material change or update, um, there's an ongoing duty to do so. And if there's been an update to disciplinary history or bankruptcy, then that comes into place in uh, 90 days. And again, um, guidance on disclosures we provided here. Some categories we believe might be useful for guidance. Um, and if you have any other feedback uh, you'd like uh, for, to share with us about what type of guidance would be helpful to you, let us know. Well, I'll talk about some other key changes and then turn it back over to you. Um, but one of the main changes with the one document is a revised structure. So under our existing uh, uh, code of ethics, we have both the principles and operative language that explains what they mean. Now we have a code of ethics that's much simpler. It's just the principles. It's six lines, much more streamlined, um, and we've actually uh, developed a poster that's available at CFP Board. It's a code of ethics poster. When we had these forms, we heard from many CFP professionals that they um, would like to hand out to their clients CFP Board's code of ethics because they believe it explained to a client what it means to work with them. And so uh, we developed this poster, the code of ethics poster, to make it available for CFP professionals if they're interested um, in, uh, uh, in using that with a client. We also have updated duties to clients. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have a new standard that deals with the use of technology. It's a very principles-based standard and an important standard that talks about when you're working with additional persons. And, Blaine, this brings in the idea of working with teams. Right. So we have a standard that talks about, you know, what, has, you know what, what the obligations are when you're working with somebody else. And, you know, one of the most important requirements there is to make sure, you know, when you're working with many people, to make sure you all know what each other are doing. Right, right. Uh, make sure, particularly if you're working in teams, as you say, to understand uh, what the uh, distribution of responsibilities would be and that they're being fulfilled. And then if you identify a situation where they're not being fulfilled, you really need to bring that to attention of the individuals on your team. And ultimately, if they're not going to be fulfilled, there's a communication obligation to the client as well. But it also you know, extends out uh, in a related way to making referrals out to engage, and I shouldn't call it really a referral, it's engaging on behalf of the client, other professionals. And they're similar to technology, and then you have an obligation to, do, uh, to make sure that you're doing so responsibly. 
That's right, and Blaine. So these are new standards in the code and standards, and uh, they're important standards that are in place that the uh, CFP Board's Board of Directors thought were really important to include in the code and standards. They hadn't been there before, so those are brand new. Um, the CFP Board has historically had standards uh, also that deal with misrepresentation of compensation methods. And so uh, one big change here now is that we now have a new specific standard for using fee-based and other similar terms that a consumer may confuse with fee-only. One of the main elements of that is if you're using fee-based, um, you can't do so in a way that suggests that you are fee-only. And, you know, when we brought up compensation, we've had a couple of questions on that already um, in this compensation area. And so somebody wants to know, can a fee-only advisor accept commissions for insurance business on things other than investments? And the answer is no, not if they want to say fee-only, because our fee-only standard looks at um, all of the compensation that comes in, not just from the CFP professional, but the CFP professional's firm, which is a defined term in the code and standards, as well as a related party if there's a connection between the work that the professional or their firm is doing with that related party. All that gets brought in. Right, and it's uh, really whenever we talk about sales-related uh, compensation, it, it is a very important defining characteristic of uh, not being able to use the term uh, fee-only. So we had another question about uh, insurance commissions that might be ongoing, uh, even if insurance is not being sold in, into the future. Is it still okay to call yourself fee-only if you're collecting those residual commissions? And there the answer is. That's right, and Blaine. If you're yeah. receiving insurance trails, then uh, you can't be fee-only. That's part of the standard. That's something that uh, CP Board went through very carefully and drew that conclusion. Um, one other key change before I talk to you, because there's a little bit more about compensation that you might want to address, but right. um, the new process for bankruptcy, um, as you know, um, the CP Board right now, its process is that if somebody um, goes through bankruptcy, that we issue a press release um, announcing that. And it doesn't count as discipline. It doesn't go through our Disciplinary Ethics Commission. And that's effectively a public letter of admonition. What we found over time was that there's sometimes a circumstance where an individual declared bankruptcy, and it wasn't a, a reflection of their inability to manage their personal finances, or there's some indication of that. Could be a very sick child, reasonable insurance coverage, couldn't uh, address the medical issues, and they had the financial issues that resulted from it. So now the new process says that um, even first bankruptcies would end up going to the Disciplinary and Ethics Commission, but it's really for that narrow issue. Does that bankruptcy not reflect an inability to manage your own finances? And so to be a very limited circumstance where somebody wouldn't end up receiving, um, you know, being part of that publication, but it does present an opportunity for somebody who's in that situation. Right. All right. So let's talk just a little bit more about the guidance on the compensation uh, that we expect to provide and probably as you look at this screen, and um, and these are the particular areas of guidance that we're already intending to provide, but I think probably it makes sense to take one step back here and just remind everyone that CFP board is compensation neutral. And so what we're really talking about here is proper representation of compensation so that it is not misleading. And what we have seen in the trade press and so forth is that there are Oftentimes, uh, it tends to be a marketing advantage associated with the term fee only. And uh, what we want to be sure is if someone is calling themselves fee only, that it is not a misrepresentation of how their compensation is collected. Everybody has uh, conflicts of one form or another, and the obligation is to avoid or uh, disclose and obtain consent and manage that conflict. So again, compensation neutral. But these are the particular items that we were looking to provide guidance on. Here we're looking for input from you as to whether you think you're the appropriate ones, examples uh, of when CFP professional may or may not describe their compensation as fee-only, uh, restrictions around the use of fee-based, and you can use fee-based. Uh, CFP board prefers to consider those uh, fee and commission, and if you do use fee-based, there is an obligation to <coughs> A state either that you're not fee only or that it's essentially fee and commission. And then there is the, we plan to explain the safe harbor that exists for compensation received by related parties. 
and provide uh, some sample policies and procedures that would satisfy that safe harbor? And then how should the CFP professional handle compensation misrepresentations? These would all be aspects that we're going to address. Blaine, we had a couple quick questions here. Sure. So one person asked about the timing. I think we're doing well. We have about 15 minutes left, so a bit of a yeah. time check as we work our way through. Yep. Um, CFP board now refers to sales-related compensation, where many of you might view that as being a commission. It's interesting. To be fee only, um, you can only accept fees, but there are some fees that if you receive, you cannot be fee only, which right. is an interesting aspect of this. We also have um, um, a list of items that we've already determined do not constitute sales-related compensation, and somebody just somebody just raised a question about that. One of those are non-monetary benefits provided by another service provider, including a custodian, that benefit the CFP professional's clients by improving the CFP professional's delivery of professional services and that are not determined based on the amount or value of client transactions. And we're being asked, can you give us an example? And I think a relatively easy example is if, a, if you're uh, holding a, a seminar, for example, for your clients, let's say they're interested in 529 plans and a custodian um, has experts in that area, and they offer to have some of their experts come out uh, to your office to help present to your clients to talk about 529 plans. That's a non-monetary benefit the custodian is providing. A CFP professional can receive that benefit and still call themselves fee only. That's okay. That's not right. sales-related compensation. That's a great illustration. All right, so let's turn now to guidance on uh, duties owed to CFP board. Uh, one, uh, and again, this is a listing of the topics that we are intending to provide guidance on and we're looking for additional guidance. What conduct must be re reported to CFP board? And I'm going to come back to you on that one, Leo, because I know we have a question that came in on it. Uh, examples of a, a narrative statement that accurately and completely describes these material facts uh, and the outcome or status of a reportable matter, and these reportable matters are, uh, are things that, again, you could uh, address in, as we're allowing people to think about this. Uh, and then finally, examples of when the CFP professional has complied with uh, or not complied with cooperation requirements. So I'm going to ask you two elements of this, Leo, while people are thinking about this. Uh, the first is uh, we had a question come in to say, what's your obligation to turn in a fellow CFP professional if uh, they are engaged in a um, in something that does not conform to the code and standards. So Blaine, uh, CFP board's position on that is we encourage CFP professionals to let us know when they found when they when they discover another CFP professional that's not living up to their standards. Right. But we don't require it. In other words, if you find out that somebody else is violating our standards and you don't report it to us, you are not violating the standards by having not shared the information. In other words, we're not going to hold you responsible for failing to share that information with us. That's fairly consistent now with how the law itself deals with those types of situations in other areas. Right. And that is not a change um, for it is under the current standards, although historically, um, years ago, CP Board did have that requirement. It's not in place now. Which is not the same as complicity. In, in a situation, right? That's, that's <laughs> right, Blaine. It's not, you're not being part of it. And one other point on the reporting. So CFP professionals provide their ethics disclosure when they're renewing their certification, and there's a list of questions we ask. Under the code and standards, we try to lay out what, our, what you as CFP professionals have determined violate CFP board standards. And so the new code of ethics is just provides greater detail about what those are in a more transparent way, given the experience we've had over the past 10 years addressing those issues. So the reporting requirements are all centered around that. They're all thinking about the types of issues that might end up you know, being an issue. And um, as opposed to providing uh, that disclosure to us every two years, we now say that you need to let us know within 30 days. In other words, it's important for safety board to know about it in real time, not two years after the fact. Right, right. All right, so let's uh, just hit a couple other uh, topics here. So we're going to provide uh, topics on, uh, well, this first one kind of gets to our complicity angle here, examples of when a CFP professional assists another in violating the law rules or regulations, um, examples of how to comply with code and standards, 
uh, when working with teams. We already talked about that a bit. Examples of how to comply with the standard for recommending, engaging, and working with additional persons. Again, we talk about the due diligence obligation that you have whenever you're making recommendations such as that. And then the, finally, the technology side, which we also touched upon. And here it's the obligation to really understand that technology and be satisfied uh, that it, there is efficacy associated with how it operates. So I think with that, maybe we'll, um, we'll continue on. And just uh, quickly, Leo, I'm going to hit on the existing guidance, and then I'm going to ask you to turn to the, uh, what we have in store for guidance. So there has already been published some uh, very worthwhile information. This first one uh, is the side-by-side -side comparison. So you're able to see explicitly where the changes were from the standard that is now in effect to the one, uh, the new code and standards that will be coming in in October. In addition to that, we have the commentary to the code and standards. Now this one is a really, really good document uh, because it provides some excellent uh, initial guidance on many of these topics. So this is one that uh, is out there on the website, and it's something that we'd certainly encourage everyone to take a look at. That's cfp.net slash code. That's where you can find all these materials. And the frequently asked questions there are, are there as well. And so th these would be some of the initial hits that have already been put out there, and you'll see more along those lines coming. And thank you, Blaine, as chair of the Standards Resource Commission, for your work and the work of all the volunteers working with you to develop this first Standards Resource Commission document, the frequently asked questions that came out very recently. Right. It's great to have that out there, and we're fortunate to have that commission. The, the members really cover the ground, as you mentioned, in terms of expertise. And then we have the CFP Board's new Ethics CE program. Now, this is a little bit of a departure from the way we've done this before. Uh, the, code and standards being uh, new is something that we wanted to make sure that we get the information out there and that we get it right. And so this is where the CFP board has put together uh, the, the learning objectives associated with this uh, new ethics CE program, uh, laid out the materials pretty well, a, but it's still distributed through those who are the CE providers uh, as opposed to directly delivered by CFP board. And there is some flexibility allowed in how these particular topics are presented, but a great deal of information there involves PowerPoint presentation, uh, some program activities, in-course polling questions. Now, there are assessment questions addressing the learning objectives as well, and that's particularly important as we uh, think about it in an online learning environment. These ethics CE uh, includes vignettes and the assessments, as I mentioned, with uh, quite a few questions, whenever, particularly if you're going in the online format. And here's, uh, here's an illustration, uh, which of the following is not a duty of the CFP professional owes to a client when engaging or recommending uh, the selection or retention of additional per uh, persons. And I, I believe this is, in fact, a polling question that we have here, correct? It is. It's a question for you. So uh, please indicate A, B, C, or D. Which one do you think is the right answer? Do you think we've given everyone the sufficient time to weigh in on I this? I think safety professionals are pretty quick. I think we can go forward. <laughs> All right. And here's what we see. So we've got a uh, we've got two contenders here, but a really one overwhelming one that uh, assume reasonable and prudent supervisory responsibilities over the additional person. And this is one where supervisory obligations are something of concern. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So this is not a duty that you have if you are um, retaining or engaging uh, engaging or recommending the selection of somebody else. It doesn't mean that you have supervisory responsibilities over them. So that is the right answer, Blaine. C is the correct answer. All right, and I think uh, here we do have that uh, highlighted for you. And I think at this point, Leo, uh, will bring us home with the discussion of uh, the forms of the additional guidance. Thank you, Blaine. And this is really the last five minutes we have here to talk about guidance. And I want to lead into this by sharing with you the perspective that the Standards Resource Commission has developed, um, which is, we believe, really important. The, the group is very focused on providing these guidance resources to creating the materials um, that they can use to help uh, guide CFP professionals with respect to the code and standards. But if CFP Board's Standards Resource Commission were to create these guidance resources, 
and nobody were to read them, it really wouldn't help anybody. So we are very focused in thinking about how can we um, share that information with CFP professionals so that it becomes useful to them. What are the channels of communication? What do you believe is the best way for CFP bo board to provide this guidance to you? Your feedback on this is particularly helpful. So if you have feedback today for us, we'd love to hear it. Let me share with you some of the ideas that we have in mind. Um, and so we'll start off with our uh, checklists and guides. Um, we mentioned earlier that we do have a disclosure guide. We have, we have a financial a reference guide for the financial planning process. We have a compliance checklist. We're actually hard at work right now in thinking about what is the next generation of those documents that we can share with CFP professionals uh, in uh, providing uh, you know, guidance to them about the code and standards. We've been working very hard on that. We will be coming out with something on that front. And you may have received or you should have received a brochure in the mail. We mailed this out to all CFP professionals. It's Have You Read the New Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct? It's a trifold brochure that talks about a commitment to high standards, a commitment to the fiduciary duty, discusses the other changes, and it shows you um, the new Code of Ethics poster that we developed. So hopefully that's something you've already received. Frequently asked questions are another useful way to provide information to CFP professionals. We just issued 30 of those. We plan on having more. Um, again, those are available on our website. Right now, it's in a document. Over time, we'll make that more interactive so that there'll be an index and you can go back and forth through them to find the one that's relevant to you. Um, articles, blogs, and social media. Again, these are um, very valuable ways that we believe we can share the information and as we work our way through this list, Blaine, I think one, uh, you know, one way we're thinking about it is we don't have to limit ourselves to one channel. And we heard that uh, whenever at the, we were out at the public forums and asked these questions about uh, format, anytime we would ask among these uh, different selections, well, we got a lot of input to say, uh, yes, they, they like uh, lots of different forms for getting the information. And uh, so we do expect to use a variety of avenues here. Let's talk about a couple more. So videos, podcasts and videos. Um, we've been having every month uh, with CP Board Stakeholder Newsletter short videos that help explain the standard. Um, we envision having even more videos for those who like to receive information that way. They could be podcasts as well um, where, um, you know, perhaps you're, you know, uh, have the time to listen to a podcast. That's maybe how you absorb the information better. We would make that available to you. Disclosure forms, we all know disclosure is such a big issue. We've had some samples, and disclosure has been, uh, you know, very uh, in the front of everybody's mind, in particular with the SEC's proposed rulemaking. Um, that's an area where CFP Board has weighed in in the past, and at some point, CFP Board plans to come up with um, another disclosure form. And then moving our way through here, um, we have notices to CFP professionals on particular issues. And then finally, um, you know, comprehensive manuals. Ultimately, CFP Board intends to put together um, a comprehensive manual, maybe like a guidebook or a handbook to our standards that collects all these guidance materials in one place so that if you're looking for what guidance CFP Board has provided, it would be contained in there. It's the kind of thing that we would update on a periodic basis. So we are right at the end. It's 4.15. Let me just conclude by talking about what's next. Or, Blaine, maybe you want to share with everybody where we go from here. Well, we certainly do want to provide a comprehensive and practical understanding of the new code and standards. Uh, we are preparing these guides that uh, Leo and I have talked about, uh, the ethics program we talked about as well, and then the CFP board resources. This is probably where we really need to point people and make sure they understand uh, that they can get the brochures, the videos, the compliance guidelines. They're all posted on the CFP board website, and as Leo mentioned, it's cfp.net slash code. Uh, we'll be putting more and more information out there as it becomes available. If there's resources you believe would be valuable to you or your firm or clients, we do ask you to please email uh, your uh, your suggestions to, again, cfpboard.org. Uh, and also, Blaine, if you'd like to send in an email, src at cfpboard.org. Well, so we want to thank you. Thank you, everybody who took time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. 
On behalf of CFP Board, and uh, I want to thank you, Blaine, for being here, for chairing the Standards Resource Commission, and for all the work that you're doing and the contributions you made to the profession. And uh, thank you to all the members of the Standards Resource Commission. Um, this concludes our program today. We encourage you uh, to read the new Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct and to take a look at the guidance materials we're making available on CFP Board's website at cfp.net slash code as they become available. Leo, it's been a pleasure of being here with you. And again, I'll echo your thanks to those who listened in to it today.